When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they observed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. They were amazed and alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said to them. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has been resurrected. He is not here. See the place where they put him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. So they went out and started running from the tomb, because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone, since they were afraid. Early on the first day of the week, after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him, as they were mourning and weeping. Yet, when they heard that he was alive and he had been seen by her, they did not believe it. Then after this, he appeared in a different form to two of them walking on their way into the country. And they went and reported to the rest, who did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who saw him after he had been resurrected. Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Welcome everyone. Happy Easter. Welcome to this time of celebrating the resurrection. I'm so glad that you're joining us today, spending time in your home celebrating our risen Savior. My name is Eric Hedberg, and I have the privilege of being a pastor of Emmanuel Covenant Church. I know watching this on a screen is far less exciting than what we are used to for Easter Sunday. It feels strange to not be together this morning of all mornings. I know I certainly feel the sadness of that. But I would encourage you all to find some ways to make today feel special. Maybe that can be with a special meal, Maybe it will be with some focused time spent together with your household. Maybe it's calling family and friends who you haven't been able to see for a few weeks here. Maybe it's enjoying some time outside, walking around your neighborhood at a safe distance from one another, and drinking in the beauty of God's creation. Regardless, my hope is that we all find some ways to make today feel extra special, because it is because it is the most joyous day of the year. Our Savior Jesus, who was dead, is alive again. Social distancing cannot stop us from celebrating that. We've tried to find some ways to make what we've put together extra special for today as well. You'll find included with our regular Sunday worship from home items, a dance performed by Hannah and a song performed by Kristen and Jackie. I'm so Grateful to them for sharing their gifts with us all today and helping make this worship from home time feel special. So I'm going to open with a word of prayer and then I'm going to invite us into some time reflecting on one of my favorite stories in all of scripture. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, this Easter morning, when so much around us is unknown and anxiety producing, we ask simply to experience your presence in these moments as we celebrate the miracle of miracles, the resurrection of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. So today, like I said, I want to share with you one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. The text uh, that Sherry read just moments ago gave us just a glimpse of the story that I'm about to share. So I'm going to read for us from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. 
but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So we went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Here, we walk alongside two people who are leaving Jerusalem on the way to Emmaus. We're told uh, the name of only one of them, Cleopas. And so it's entirely possible that the person with Cleopas is his wife. Uh, It could also be a friend or brother or other family member. But regardless, they are leaving Jerusalem on their way home to Emmaus, discussing everything that had happened. Uh, Certainly, we imagine that has to include the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus because they Uh, talk about that with Jesus, the one they had hoped was the Messiah. But who knows, maybe they were there for all of it, going back to Jesus entering Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey to the waving of palm branches and the shouts of Hosanna. As they're reliving and discussing all that had happened, a man comes and joins them on their walk, but they're kept from recognizing him. This, This has always been a bizarre moment to me. Why? Why are they kept from recognizing Jesus? Luke doesn't tell us. Uh, Clearly, Jesus is a man. He's there in human form, walking alongside them. It's a very normal and natural thing. But there's this other thing going on behind it all that they cannot see. It's something strange and mysterious. Jesus is risen, but at least in this moment, they cannot recognize him. There's a fullness to this moment that they are not yet privy to. That changes, but at first, even with all they've seen, they don't recognize Jesus himself next to them. As the unrecognized Jesus joins them, he asks what they're talking about. I imagine they stop dead in their tracks and just stare, mouths wide open, incredulous that this man walking next to them could ask such a question. It reminded me, I was talking with some ministry colleagues recently, and one of them shared this shocking story. She was in her office, and in walked a member of her church who said, making small talk, so is there anything going on with this COVID-19 thing? She recounted that moment. I imagine she looked the same way these two disciples probably looked, just baffled that a question like that could come up, that people could not know what was going on. How could he not know? Has he not watched any of our wonderful Dr. Bonnie Henry? Has he not been to a store and seen the long lineups outside? Has he missed the overwhelming amount of information being put out by seemingly every organization about what they're doing to address this unprecedented moment? The disciples, I I think, graciously respond with a, a brief summary, just kind of hoping it will strike a note of recognition with this stranger who's walking alongside them. But Jesus doubles down with his question, asking, what things? The disciples realize they're just going to have to explain it all. 
And so walking beside Jesus himself, these two offer their understanding of Jesus, the way the trial and the crucifixion played out. And then they shared their hope, the hope that he would redeem Israel. What I would argue is pretty bold of them. They even offer the news of the empty tomb and the word from the angels that Jesus is alive. They end their explanation by saying that some of the other disciples went to the tomb and found it empty, just as the women had told them. But they, too, did not see Jesus. I tend to wonder at the mood, at the tone of this explanation. Is this all said with great sadness? Are they downtrodden? Are they devastated by the darkness of Good Friday? Is that what is looming in them as they're explaining? Or are they perhaps experiencing a glimmer of hope? Clearly not fully realized at this moment, but hope that something had now happened, that something that they could not explain. I'll admit too that I'm a bit shocked that this isn't, that it isn't the response from Jesus that opens their eyes to who he is. Jesus speaks to these two the way we often hear Jesus speaking to his disciples wanting them to understand more, to understand better, to believe more in the ways he is fulfilling the scriptures, in the ways that Jesus is the one that the prophets were pointing to. Jesus says to them, how foolish you are. The Greek word there is anoetos, which means pertaining to unwillingness to use one's mental faculties in order to understand. Uh, So just to be clear, Jesus is not calling these two out for being unintelligent but for essentially blinding themselves to the truth that is well within their grasp. Jesus isn't commenting on their cognitive abilities. Jesus is commenting on their faith. Their faith that Jesus is exactly who he told them he was. And then also true to Jesus' interactions with his disciples, even after offering a convicting challenge, Jesus takes the time to explain. And here he begins all the way back at the beginning of the scriptures, walking through Moses and the prophets and how all of that pertains to Jesus. The two invite Jesus to come and stay with them as they arrive in Emmaus. They recline at the table for a meal and Jesus takes the bread. He gives thanks. He breaks it and then he begins to give it to them. And it's in that moment, in the breaking of bread, that they recognize Jesus. And then Jesus vanished from their sight. I I know I already said it uh, a couple times, but this is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. And it's one of my favorite for a couple of reasons. And one of those reasons is this theme that we have throughout the whole story of this interplay, this relationship between the normal, the everyday, the seemingly mundane, and the mysterious, the glorious, the miraculous interactions with Jesus. Uh, We'll get to the second reason it's a favorite in just a moment. But first, I want to dive a little deeper into this idea of the normal moments of life becoming miraculous. Here we see basic, everyday things. Walking, traveling home after a huge holiday celebration, talking along the way, inviting a new friend to stay and have dinner, and then breaking bread, having a meal together. Not one of those things is in and of itself particularly special. I imagine this is a road these two have walked many, many times. I imagine they have had countless conversations about any manner of things. I also imagine that inviting weary travelers to stay with them was familiar territory. And of course, reclining to eat at a meal is nothing special. That's a multiple time a day thing. These are the moments that make up the vast majority of all of our days, the everyday normal things we do. And yet in the midst of those, Jesus appears. Jesus walks alongside. Jesus explains who he is. And finally, Jesus reveals himself to these two. The story is so powerful for me because these are the ways that I've met Jesus in my own life. I don't have a dramatic conversion story. I can't point to the exact moment where I started following Jesus because as far as I can remember, it has been an ongoing, lifelong journey. 
What I do remember, though, is moments along the way when Jesus revealed himself to me. Driving into the camp I grew up at as a kid. Singing songs at the top of my lungs in the rec hall. Standing at the top of a mountain, skis under my feet, smelling the fresh air and taking in the wonder of creation all around me. Sitting and laughing with good friends, talking about everything and nothing at the same time. Walking around our neighborhood, visiting friends and family and playing with their children. An invitation to a Zoom hangout time with former staff members of mine. I could go on and on and on. And that's what is so powerful about who Jesus is for me and what we see about Jesus in this story. The list of normal, everyday, seemingly mundane moments that Jesus has stepped into, where Jesus has been present to me, where Jesus has revealed himself to me, that list is endless. And right now, with this moment we're in as as a community, as a nation, as a world, it may often feel like we're stuck in the mundane. It's not particularly normal, I recognize that, but it is certainly much less exciting than we're accustomed to. Days look and feel largely the same. We're mostly all staying put, venturing out minimally. And it can be easy to fall into the trap of thinking that Jesus can't possibly do something miraculous in these mundane moments of our lives. But we have right here, in this account of Jesus appearing to these two disciples, the first time Jesus appears to people in Luke, the promise that it is exactly in these moments, the normal, everyday, mundane moments, that Jesus makes his presence known to us, if we're willing to pay attention. I don't know about you, but there have been many days already in the midst of this pandemic when I've needed this very reminder. So let me say it again. It is in these moments, the moments that may seem mundane or uninteresting, that Jesus appears to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And it is in these very moments that the Savior of the world comes to you, walks beside you, offers conviction and correction and encouragement, and makes himself known to you. So now there is a little bit more to this story. Let me finish. I'm going to be reading verses 33 to 35. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. After these disciples had their eyes opened and they recognized the risen Christ there with them, the one who had been with them on their walk from Jerusalem, the one who explained the scriptures and how they pointed to Jesus, the one who gave thanks and broke bread. After they recognized Jesus and Jesus disappeared from their sight, they knew that they could not keep this to themselves. They got up and they returned at once the seven miles to Jerusalem. This news was that urgent. They had seen the risen Christ. Of course, they had to go right away to share the news of their Savior with the ones that Jesus told them are now family, their brothers and sisters in him. And another reason I love this story so much is this moment right here. When these two disciples arrive back to find the eleven so excited to share what they have seen, they find the eleven already excited and celebrating themselves Because Jesus had appeared to Simon Peter. There, back in Jerusalem, they gathered and they shared stories of the risen Christ. It's a simple thing, but it is a profound thing. And it's something that I'm afraid we don't do enough of. Simply sharing our stories of encountering Christ. So let that be my encouragement for you today. As you are reflecting on and remembering those moments when you have encountered the living Christ, that you share that with someone. What is it that happened? What did Jesus say to you? How did it make you feel? How did he reveal himself to you? 
and what is different now because you encountered Jesus. Here again, the declaration from the disciples as the two from Emmaus returned to Jerusalem. They said, it is true. It is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me pray. Risen Christ, like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, we struggle to recognize you in the everyday journey of our lives. We seek your wisdom in the midst of the questions we have about the circumstances we find ourselves in, circumstances sometimes beyond our control. Open our eyes, Jesus, light of the world, to your work of transformation in and around us. As we walk with you day by day, may your new life be made manifest in what we say to others. Help us to understand the power of our words to hurt or to heal. Give us the graciousness to make all our conversations holy. So often we forget, Holy One, that you invite us to abide with you, to have our lives fully wrapped up in you. We thank you that you travel with us in our joys and in our concerns, in our everyday moments. We pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single light, it tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every heart and every love? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Ooh, you say when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I am falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours. And I believe, I, oh, I believe I, what you say to me. I, I believe the only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. Good Easter Sunday morning, all my lovely children. I'm sending out my, my excitement and my joy at being able to reach you today with the wonderful story of Easter. 
So hi, Aaron, Joey, hi, Serena and Stephen, and hi, Morgan. And to any other children who are sharing in our story today, I'm reading from the Beginner's Bible, and I want to share the story about how Jesus came to save us all. Do you remember last week on the previous Sunday, Palm Sunday, how we were celebrating Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem? Well, I said this week was gonna be a little different. This was Holy Week now, and this is the story of how Jesus came to the world sent by our Heavenly Father to suffer a little or a lot and to die for us in our sin, to carry it all away, but then to arise once again, to go back up into heaven with our Heavenly Father. So I want to read again from our Beginner's Bible the story. First of all, Jesus is arrested and crucified. Now, at the end of Palm Sunday, we talked about how the leaders were jealous and angry that Jesus was performing wonderful miracles and how many people had wanted to follow him. And uh, so they gathered, and here's what they did. Judas went to the leaders. He asked, how much will you pay me if I help you capture Jesus? They said, 30 pieces of silver. So Judas took the money and made a plan. Now remember, Judas was one of the 12 chosen disciples, so he was very close to Jesus. Here's a picture of Judas with the leaders being negotiating and getting money. Jesus had gone to a favorite garden to pray. The disciples went along. Jesus prayed, Father, if it is your will, I am ready to give my life so that all the people who trust in me will be saved from their sins. Soon, Judas arrived with some soldiers. Peter wanted to protect Jesus, but Jesus said, no, I must allow this to happen. All the disciples ran away and the soldiers arrested Jesus. There's one of the soldiers. He looks very, very angry. His knife is out. And Jesus is just submitting and going with the soldiers. They took Jesus to the leaders. The leaders said, you say that you are the son of God. We do not believe you. There you can see a soldier holding Jesus and the leaders. Oh, well, those leaders. The soldiers took charge of Jesus. They made him carry a wooden cross. They took him to a place called the skull. There they nailed Jesus to the cross. Jesus died on the cross. So you can see he's carrying his cross and there is uh, probably one of the Marys at the feet of Jesus in this picture. So sad that Jesus had died. Before we go on with the story, I wanted to point out to you that I'm wearing a wooden cross. And to me, this is a symbol. A symbol is something that you put your trust in and you believe in. It reminds you of something. This reminds me of Jesus, that he took all of the sins, all of my sins, from the time I was born to the time I will pass, he's carried them away with him. And for each and every one of us, this is a symbol of how Jesus died on this cross for me and for you, and we got complete forgiveness from our Holy Father in heaven forever and ever because of what Jesus did for us. So when you see a cross like that on a neck, on a gold chain, wherever, remember, think of Jesus and what he did for us. What a great gift he gave us. And I have, I have one of my grandkids is often just looking around and, and she said when she was little, and she was about four or five years old, she would look at telephone poles and she'd say, Grandma, there's a cross. Or a fence post and she'd say, Grandma, there's a cross. Crosses are all around us. See how many crosses you can see 
in your day-to-day -day life. But always remember what this is a symbol of, the love of Jesus, who died for us so that we would be forgiven our sins. Everyone who loved Jesus was very sad, but they forgot something important. Jesus had said he would see them again soon. Here's a picture of his disciples and loved ones that might have been around the cross at the time that he passed. He died at the middle. Between those two other crosses were two very bad people who had robbed and murdered or done violent crime to others, and they died on the cross with Jesus. So this is one of the common pictures we see, three crosses on a hill. But the story of the good news is just now coming. Jesus is risen. This is why we celebrate Easter Sunday and each and every day of our lives that Jesus survived and was raised from the dead and lives with the Father in heaven. And he surrounds us with his love. After Jesus died, some of his friends laid his body in a big tomb. They sealed it shut with a large round stone. Soldiers guarded the tomb. Here you can see a great big stone slab and soldiers guarding it. We saw a tomb like that when we were in Jerusalem with the church in 2017. Massive big stone, heavy stone, very difficult to roll. Once it settled in place, almost impossible to move. Three days later, the earth shook. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven and pushed the stone away from the tomb. Pushed the stone away from the tomb. Then the angel sat on the stone. This is a wonderful picture. Here's the angel sitting on the stone. Oh, what a wonderful thing to see that the tomb is open. When the soldiers saw the angel, they fell to the ground. Can you imagine? I can't imagine what that was like. They must have been so frightened. They were supposed to guard that tomb. There was not supposed to be anything happening to that tomb. But an angel had arrived. Mary was walking to the tomb with some of her friends. They saw the angel who said, Do not be afraid. Jesus is not here. He has risen. Go and tell Peter and the other disciples that Jesus is alive. Here are the, the Marys all together. They were going to the tomb. They were very sad, but imagine how happy they were that the angel told them that Jesus was not there. He was gone already. To see an angel, oh, must be so exciting. On their way, the women saw Jesus. They fell to their knees and worshiped him. Jesus smiled and said, go tell the others that I will see them in Galilee. So Mary ran to tell the disciples. There they are at the feet of Jesus. He's there, he's alive, he's risen, hallelujah. And that is why we celebrate at Easter. Jesus came, did what God wanted him to do, took all of our sins for all time, for all humanity, died on the cross, took them away, and then arose. He arose and he lives with the Father now. So I'd just like to pray with you. Oh, dear Lord God, thank you. Thank you for your son. Dear Jesus, thank you that you would carry my sins away. Even into death, you carried my sins away. Lord, how you love me, how you love each one of us who know you. And Lord, I just pray that for each and every child, parent, family member, wherever you are, you are all brothers and sisters in Christ. And I just pray that we may celebrate this day, but we may celebrate what you've done for us, dear Jesus, each and every day of our lives. May we grow and grow in our faith. Dear Lord, we pray and we thank you all in our beloved Jesus' name. Amen.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights am I? Jesus commands my 